Hello, and welcome to today's podcast. I am very excited to talk to Alex Williams today. He's a fellow Canadian and content creator at Nightworthy Media House. And you'll see, he's very, very passionate about his topic. We actually recorded this interview through Skype and then used our own recording devices. So it's a little bizarre how this was pieced together and it took a little longer than expected. But at the end of the day, it was a great time. And Alex ended up interviewing me for his podcast. That was really, really fun. You must now know that I love talking to people who are passionate about their topic. They can be scholars, students, academics, and many more like podcasters. And you might have noticed that not all the topics in the podcasting list are Canadian, although this one is. And I am. I'm Rosie. I'm a Francophone from Canada, and this is my podcast. Now we're going to hit the rails with this history, eh? So today we're talking with Alex, and I'm going to let him introduce his topic. It's quite fascinating. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'm Alex, and today I wanted to come on to talk about Canada Pacific Railway uh, and the history of it and how it connects with Western Canada and Alberta, because it's just such a cool topic. I was telling Rosie earlier that the way that I kind of came to find out about it and I mean, obviously, it's always been prevalent. It's headquartered in my hometown, Calgary. But the way that I really came to know this story is from a conductor at Heritage Park, which is a historical outdoor museum back home. Uh, You can wander around and they have a working steam engine that goes around the park and stops at three different places. And, you know, you go around and you get all these tours and stuff. And this conductor showed us around these old train cars. It was the last presentation he ever did actually it was his retirement day it was his last day at work and he told me about this and I just thought that is such a neat story and there's so much neat information about where I'm from and where my family came from and how my family came across Canada that I just I share it a lot with a lot of different people because I think it's cool well I really appreciate you like I said reaching out to me on Twitter and saying hey how about we try this I mean It's really nice to have a fellow Canadian on the show, (laughs) so I appreciate it. And it'll be really interesting to hear everything you have to say on the topic since, as you said, it's in Calgary, it's in, you know, your hometown. Yeah, it actually, but it started in Montreal, which is very cool. For those who might not know, Montreal is not near Calgary. Maybe, you know, people who are not, (laughs) people who are not familiar with geography, maybe we should... Give them an idea of how far it is or how long it would take to drive. Yeah, uh, so actually, let me look it up on maps here. How long would it take to drive from Montreal? I'm guessing four days, but that might include sleeping for a little bit too. Yeah, so okay, if you were to drive straight, Calgary to Montreal, uh, it would be 36 hours of driving. So I definitely break that up into at least four days. That's a long trip. That's across quite a few countries if you were in Europe. So yeah. Actually, really cool visual to kind of put things in concept of how big Canada is. St. John's, Newfoundland is closer to London, England than it is to Vancouver, British Columbia. Same country, but you would be better off flying across the ocean. You'd get to London faster than you would get to Vancouver. So it's, it's pretty wild. That is kind of crazy. Yeah. Yeah, Canada, we are a very wide country, that's for sure. Very wide, and we like it. Yeah, we do. We love all of the lands we have. Yeah. So you say it starts in Montreal. So did you want to start us off from right from the beginning? Yeah, so let's start there. It started in 1881 is when it really started. Um, But if you jump back a little bit further to the Confederation of Canada... And so when, when Canada became a country, it was, just, it was just four provinces in 1867, and they wanted British Columbia to join in them. British Columbia had a little bit of an interest, and this was in the early 1870s that British Columbia was like, yeah, okay, like, maybe we'll join this little confederation here. And in order to do that, because British Columbia, like we mentioned, is way, way far from Ontario, which was then the furthest west in Canada. And... In order to kind of join the two colonies, the two groups, they had to connect somehow, right? And at the time, it was just all prairie. It was semi-arid land, 
and nothing was really growing there. 20,000 people, that was the complete population of Western Canada at the time. And so the Conservative government that was in power at the time, that was Sir John A. Macdonald, the first Prime Minister of Canada, and he pushed for it, he encouraged it. Um, But then I think it was in 1873, his government kind of fell apart. Uh, There were some scandals that fell apart. And then uh, the Liberal government came in, and they didn't really have an interest in extending the railroad out that way. So it got put on hold until, again, in 1881, when the Conservative government was in power again, Sir John A. Macdonald was Prime Minister again, he started pushing for it again. Um, And this is really, I mean, today in modern politics, we talk a lot about how we just had the Canadian election. Alberta and Saskatchewan, two Western provinces, voted almost 80% Conservative. So really, that voting conservative stems from this time when, well, the conservative government built the railroad out. So it's funny to see how these political ideas that people generally ascribe to certain places aren't even necessarily about the ideas. It's just, oh, that party helped us 150 years ago, you know, so we'll kind of stick with them. It's funny to see how far back that goes. But then, yeah, it was in 1881 that finally the railroad started to be built. And was that on the East Coast at that point? Because you mentioned Montreal, so I guess the starting point was there. Yeah, so they started in Montreal. Um, Canada Pacific Rail today runs from Montreal to Vancouver, uh, and they go down even into Detroit and a little bit else into the States, um, and then as far north as Edmonton um, in Alberta. So it's really far-reaching, but yeah, they started in Montreal and started building out, out that way. And interestingly, where... CP Rail started, originally, the Canadian government put out a bid saying, hey, we need to build this railroad. We want your bids, right? So everybody comes in and they're saying, oh, well, we'll build it here. This will be the route that we take. This is how much it'll cost. This is this, this is that, right? And most of them, almost all of them, actually, they went under the Great Lakes and in the States, in the U.S. And the reason that they would go through the United States is because the rail was already built there. So if, if you were going to build a railroad across Canada and you can just not build the part that is the Great Lakes, it saves you a ton of money, right? That's a massive, massive area. And if you can just latch on and pay a leasing fee, it saves you a lot of upfront cash. So most of these proposals said, we'll go under the Great Lakes through the United States, right? And we'll come back up and then go across the prairies. And the government said, absolutely not. You can't go through the United States. It has to be 100% in Canada. And the reason for that, of course, is because if the United States were ever to come up and try and take Western Canada, right, we would have to get troops from Eastern Canada, where all the population is, and move them to Western Canada to defend the territory, right? Yeah. And so, of course... They said, absolutely not. It has to stay in Canada because if you build through the United States and we have to get troops over there to defend, well, of course, they're not going to let our army pass through their country so that we can fight them on the other side. It's really a game of money, population, war, like everything was an issue in this. And then CP Rail won the bid because they said, yeah, we're going to build out this way. And uh, and they, they said, however much it'll cost. And the amount in today's dollars is over a trillion dollars. Could you imagine the government today saying, yes, we'll fund that trillion dollar project? No, absolutely not. No, but the reason that they did is because British Columbia would not join the Confederation without the railroad. This was a must. Well, that makes sense. That makes sense. Absolutely. Yeah, if you can't get across the country, then you're not part of the country, really, right? So ultimately... CP Rail is the one that won out. I mean, it's still a company today because it was an obvious success, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess back then too, the cars would not have been what we have now. They probably wouldn't reach the speeds we have now. I don't know what the speed would have been. um, But if you go to Heritage Park, if you're ever in Calgary and you have a chance, you'll actually be able to ride on some of the original cars that they had back then and you can go and explore the cars that queen elizabeth and king george came over in 
and it's it's very clear even though it's luxury i mean i think winston churchill might have even ridden on one of those cars and uh it's very luxury but it's very clear like it's very old-fashioned right it is it is not the same uh, technology by any means of what we have today so what type of you said it's a steam engine yeah so what type of things does that involve for anybody who might not be familiar with that so a steam engine i guess yeah i guess in the modern age um we might not be super familiar with steam power so it was an 1800s technology and incredibly incredibly useful there are stories of people traveling from england to north america And when they leave, steam engines had not been invented, so they're traveling on the sail ship. But while they're on their way, steam engines are invented. People have a little bit more power behind them. And the steam engine makes it to North America before the sail ship that left before (laughs) even gets there. So steam power is really cool. Um, It works similar to a combustion engine in the way that um, it turns something, right? Like the explosion, the motion. And in this, it's steam that turns the turbines and gets things moving. So you got to think to move tons and tons and tons. I think I read last month in November of 2019, they moved, I don't know how many millions of metric tons of wheat just in November alone. And so the amount of power that goes in to moving that. So a lot of heat, a lot of coal probably seen in movies. They're shoveling coal in. That's how they get the heat going. And then there's a boiler and the water will heat, the steam will rise and it'll turn the turbines, which will get the get the machine moving. But I mean, think of how much steam you'd need to move all these tons of goods. Right. Um, And today, from what I understand, they use diesel engines, which are a lot more efficient, better for the environment and can pull a lot more weight. Yeah. And I've heard that the trains have uh, a main car on each end so they can go back and forth essentially either direction yeah and if you see some trains moving across the prairies you'll see multiple uh, engines on either end because they're pulling so much and you'll see some of the cars are or some of the trains are you know a quarter of a mile long and just these huge huge things just moving across so it was a well-tested design we had had steam engines for a while by then but uh, it was still a very expensive project, but ultimately, ultimately worth it in order to connect the country, distribute goods. And as we'll see further in this conversation, to get a population in the prairies and help Canada's industry. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because if you're talking, you know, BC and more East Coast ish from mm-hmm. there, there is no British or French population there yet in between. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So it was very scarce. You, the amount of people that lived on the prairies, it was, there were forts. It would be the indigenous peoples that would be living in the prairies. Yeah, so a lot of indigenous peoples. And then there were forts set up by the Northwest Mounted Police, uh, which would be now more like the RCMP. Because all that region, that whole region there was considered the Northwest Territories. And it was for for years and so there were just trading posts uh hudson bay trading posts all the way out there where they would trade goods with the native population but other than that there there wasn't much transportation you'd have to ride across on your horse or wander your way around out of curiosity do you have an idea how long this railway would be because i mean as we've mentioned the country is very wide so it's not just a few kilometers yeah, so so it's not like it's huge. From what I understand, um, stretching from uh, Port Moody in British Columbia all the way to Montreal, where it first started, Canadian Pacific Railway is about forty seven hundred kilometers. That's wild, which is about sixteen hundred kilometers longer than the original first transcontinental railroad. Um, so it was a massive project, like I mentioned before, over a trillion dollars in today's money. Just just wild. You mentioned earlier how your family got to Calgary. So do you have an interesting story about that? Yeah. So, um, I mean, obviously, uh, being a few generations down, there are a million different stories of how my family got to Calgary. I always think the most interesting history is your own, right? And, And for my family personally, we came from Ukraine on this one side. We came from Ukraine early, early 1900s. My great-great-grandfather and his brother moved from Ukraine 
to Saskatchewan. Uh, and the way that you did that back then was you would pile on to the train car. Canada Pacific Railway was really good at getting farmers out because the only way that they could make their money back, because remember, this was a huge investment. And which before I jump into that, I should mention the Canadian government paid CP Rail partially in land. They said, we don't have a ton of money. Here, take all of this semi-arid, infertile land in Alberta and Saskatchewan. That's yours, right? And, uh, and so Canada Pacific Rail owns all of this land, but it's not producing anything. So they, they go to Europe and they start advertising to people, you know, come start this new life, right? We always hear about this. We always see all these old-fashioned posters, right? And they go out and they say, you know, quarter section is this much, half a section is this much, full section is this much, and they're inviting all these people to come out. Well, my great-great-grandfather and his brother came across, I think they actually landed in New York City, and then went up to Montreal and took the train all the way across Canada and into Saskatchewan. So I guess it's not quite all the way across, but they stopped in Saskatchewan where they bought a parcel of land. And they bought this land and they start farming it. The deal with CP Rail was that if you started producing crops in the first few seasons, we'll give you half your money back. And of course, you know, half our money back, you know, the land was already reasonably cheap. This is fantastic, right? So you've got farmers working this land that really wasn't amazing. It wasn't fantastic land. And they start working this land and and trading tricks and trading secrets and letting each other know, oh yeah, plant your seeds like this, plant your seeds like that. Oh, this type of wheat grows really well here. Oh, this wheat, you know, and doing artificial selection for which wheat to grow and canola and all these different things. And and eventually a lot of them a lot of them did produce crops and now as we know we produce a ton and a ton of wheat in the in the prairies as well as corn and canola and ultimately it's because of that incentive get half your money back and uh and of course cp rail had interest in seeing the farmers produce because if cp rail had nothing to transport they don't make any money right and so they so set up model farms saying hey you know look at this this is how you grow things here this is how you farm things here and they started educating all these new european families on producing these crops for the country it's how a lot of families came across and it wasn't luxurious the train would stop at certain spots you could get off and uh, take a leak or you could you know stay on the train or you could totally miss your train because it's leaving at this time and then you're there right and uh, I imagine there are a lot of family stories where, yeah, and then grandpa was stuck. So he went and got a job on a farm and, you know, it happens. It happened a lot. It's so funny to hear you talk about that story. I have a, I guess, a slightly different version of that. Mm -hmm. So my family stopped in Ontario. Yeah. They came through, I think it was the St. Lawrence probably that they came through. Yeah. Because we're, we're part of the French uh, people that came through. Okay. The Francophone. Yeah. And they stopped in Ontario and it was actually a different type of hardship. They had to deforest land because nothing grew. Right. Which is the total opposite, but still just as much work, really. Yeah. It's just so funny to hear that. I never thought about the differences. Uh, you know, it just doesn't cross your mind unless you've lived it or, you know, your family history. Yeah, yeah, it is really interesting. And actually, the cool thing, um, so of course, when they're in Ontario, they're having to de do a lot of deforestation to get the rail through. Well, once they once they got into the prairie provinces, there was no granite or anything or any trees that they had to cut down. So they're just... They're just building things down. Um, they, they bring in the steel and they, they lay the track. And um, throughout the prairie provinces, they were laying up to five miles of rail a day during that time. I'm sure in Ontario, it took much longer. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And then, as you can imagine, once they got out to British Columbia, because uh, you're going through the mountains there. So, BC, let me just say, there's a reason that it says beautiful British Columbia on the license plates. It is gorgeous. Um, and I mean, any area of Canada is amazing, but British Columbia uh, is just phenomenal. Yeah, it goes through the mountains. They blew up sides of the mountains. They made tunnels through the mountains. Um, one thing that you'll want to put in put in show notes or, or share somewhere is Rogers Pass. It's this stunning, stunning bridge. And I think at the time that it was built, it was built back in the 1800s as part of this project. At the time that it was built, 
it was, I think, the highest bridge in in the world. And it's it's absolutely gorgeous. I've never been to it, but uh, it's in central British Columbia or lower central, I think. And uh, just absolutely stunning. But yeah. It's on your to-do list. <laughs> it is on my very, very long to-do list. First, I got to go back to Vancouver Island, though, because that place is immaculate, too. Mm-hmm. Someday I will visit that end of the country. At some point. Yeah, I f- I, I'm that way about the east. I want to get out there. It's I just don't know a ton of people. I've been to bits of the East Coast, but not with my family. So I'd rather go back with my family and enjoy it and actually take the train. I keep hearing the train ride across Canada is just incredible. You know, that is something I would love to do. They do that. uh, CP Rail does that in, I think, June and July. They do this rail trip. And I know one of the routes that they go on is from Calgary to British Columbia I forget where they stop and then they come back to Calgary and you just get to see this little part of the country but you get to do it by rail and on old luxury rail cars too Uh, rail cars from like the 30s and 20s and stuff so anybody who loves the retro that's very retro though yeah Um, so that would be really cool they do some amazing things as well Um, one thing Winnipeg Beach I don't know if you've ever heard of it but it used to be this big resort and it was right on Lake Winnipeg, which is just this massive, massive lake in the middle of Manitoba. And Winnipeg Beach was this resort that they put on because, like I mentioned, they had to make their money back, right? And one of the ways that they did that was tourism, right? We talked about farming. We talked about transportation, luxury travel, but tourism was huge too. So Winnipeg Beach, they set up this beautiful thing and and it had lights. You know when you picture like this beautiful boardwalk late at night, right? But it was on this beautiful giant lake and apparently it was a huge honeymoon destination. People would come in on the train at night. It was like a midnight special. They'd come in on the train at night. This whole tourist town at Winnipeg Beach was lit up with all these beautiful lights and just gorgeous and romantic, apparently. Apparently the most romantic spot in Canada. And you'd come in on the train, and you'd see the town through the window. And it was apparently just this beautiful scene. And I mean, if you have any romance for the past, this would be it, right? And they did some other amazing things, um, if I can get get into that too. Absolutely. (laughs) So Banff National Park, second national park in North America, first one in Canada. Where is it located for those who might not know? Yeah, so so Banff is located in Alberta and it was actually built and designed for tourism. Like they got there, CP Rail got there, and of course they're thinking about their pocketbook, right? They're it's a business. And they get there and they think, Boy, this is gorgeous. We can sell it, right? And so they make it into this national park, this gorgeous national park huge mountains uh just it's about an hour hour and a half outside of calgary and you go out there and it's these huge mountains and this idyllic mountain town and i learned you cannot have a second residency there if you own a home there that has to be your primary residency you can't live in banff unless you work in banff so it's not it's a tourist town kept very um very local right but people come from all over. They have signs, street signs in Japanese and Chinese and English and French. And um, and they have other things in all sorts of languages because, well, again, CP Rail had to make their money back. So what do they do? They start the first ever travel agency. They get pictures and paintings and all these things. And they make up little brochures and pamphlets. And they send their travel agents to Europe. And these travel agents go to parties with Europeans and they say, oh, this place in Banff, oh, it's called Banff. Let me tell you about it. It's uh, uh, this beautiful Canadian mountain town and it's this and it's that. And oh, look at this brochure I just happened to bring with me. And it's gorgeous, right? And they get all of these Europeans interested, all these wealthy Europeans interested. So, of course, they have to build a place for them to stay. There's a hot springs at Banff. That was part of the draw, right? But they have to build a place for them to stay. So they build the Banff Springs Hotel, which if you Google this, it's just this massive, massive castle. Um, And it's set in the middle of the mountains right on the Bow River, um, which the Bow River is the river that 
one of the rivers that runs through Calgary. It's a major river in Alberta. And and it's just this gorgeous stone castle looking thing. If you go inside, some of the roofs are really small. Some of the ceilings are really short. And it feels like you're walking through this old castle. And yeah, they brought people over to come and stay and, and stay in the Canadian Rockies. And, and it became this major tourist destination. To this day, I think about 10,000 people live there uh, in Banff. But any given day, there are about 40,000. They get 4 million visitors a year. And it really started as, dang it, we just spent a trillion dollars building this railroad. We've got to make our money back. And, and of course, they did. Well, when you add an area like Banff or mm-hmm. anywhere really in the mountainous areas of Canada, you can't really go wrong. <laughs> no, no, you really, you really can't. Yeah. So one thing that I want to touch on before we go on is the Chinese immigrants who worked on the railroad. And I know a lot of the conversation I've been giving out uh, has been very like, yeah, CP Rail is great. And yeah, Canada is great. And I love both things because I think Canada is my home. CP Rail helped build Western Canada, um, but they didn't do it without these Chinese immigrants. And there were about 15,000 of them working on the railroad. And historians estimate anywhere from 500 to 800 died while working on the railroad. They got paid about a dollar a day. And the living conditions, of course, weren't great. I mean, what can you expect for the late 1800s, right? But at the same time, I think they were treated particularly poorly. Um, historically, Chinese Canadians were have been treated fairly poorly. But it was in 2006 that the Canadian government gave an apology, not just to how Chinese immigrants were treated on the railroad, but also just in general, um, even up to Sir Wilfrid Laurier, one of kind of earlier, you might look at him if you know anything about history as being maybe a little bit more progressive than earlier prime ministers. But even still, he wanted very specific people to immigrate to, to Canada and the Chinese were not one of those groups and so I just think it's interesting that you know after these years we we give that apology but I think more than just an apology it's a, it's a thanks like these people helped build this country and build you know uh, the lives that my family has been blessed with and uh, and I, I just think it's it's important to acknowledge that effort and that group of people that they participated that way in history Absolutely, that needs to be in history books, and we do need to talk about it. Mm -hmm. And I guess now we can talk about, you know, the railroad was there, Mm -hmm. or was being built anyway, and now what do we do with it? I mean, it still runs across Canada. I know we have dismantled bits of it, because I know there's parts even around here where we have abandoned railways, and they've covered them, or they've made them into nature trails or whatnot. But for the most part, the railway still runs across Canada, so... You know, what do we do with it? It is very much alive. Um, it It's still a huge part of Canadian industry. You'll see, you'll see oil being transported across Canada on the railway. You'll see wheat being transported. Those are really, I mean, two of the major, major exports, especially for Western Canada, right? That's how we make our money. And so you see that a lot. It still stops at elevators at grain elevators though the modern grain elevator is significantly different from the old ones um but yeah it's still transporting goods um like we mentioned earlier in the show it's still transporting people though certainly not as often it's more of like a oh let's you know as an experience kind of thing right and so it's it's still very much doing the same things that it always has. And if you look at Canada Pacific Rail uh, as a company in general, it's created hotel chains. It's created um, farming organizations like, and all of these other things, oil companies. It even created an airline of bush planes. And for those who might not know, so bush planes, they go in the bush, but what's their purpose? Usually bush planes, from what I understand, they're, they're generally used to transport people around smaller uh, communities in usually within the Arctic Circle a lot of the time because there aren't as many roads out there um, just to kind of it's transportation, right? For a country that's very big. Very big. Yeah, because you can't I mean, building roads in Canada, building trains in Canada, it's expensive. You have this massive landmass. 
and 35 million people, right? Transportation is always going to be a huge issue in, I guess, the Canadian Canadian eye. And most of those people border the Canada-United States border. Yeah, I think 80% of Canadians or something live within three hours of the, the American border. American being the United States, for those who aren't in North America, I know it tends to be confusing. You could do a whole podcast on the term America and how different people use it and what they're talking about. Because for me, I refer to this as the states, but I refer to the border as the American border. And it's just like... Confusing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's very, very... Uh, it's, it's a different language. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, even within Canada, there are different dialects. Like you mentioned, Francophones, like uh, people in Newfoundland speak very different from people on the West Coast and even from farmers in Saskatchewan. They have lots of different cultures too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's such a diverse and beautiful country. And it's nice that I guess the, the railway was really the original way that we could connect all of these different cultures and peoples. And, and uh, hopefully we can continue connecting all of these unique cultures and in other ways mm -hmm. absolutely well with the advent of internet and such i mean oh yeah it definitely helps right mm -hmm. okay and i ask this often if you had a time machine and i'll preface this by saying you should come back safe unless you jump off a cliff yourself okay. and you make that decision okay <laughs> okay but if you had a time machine would this subject be the thing that you would most love to observe Ooh. <laughs> or if you want, what would be the part that you'd love to observe or be part of? You know, I would be really fascinated because I, I'm interested in business. I have a business of my own. I love business. I would be really fascinated to kind of just like be a fly on the wall in those, you know, old timey 150 years ago kind of business meetings and just see what these men were talking about, right? Like why they chose to go different directions, why they chose this path and not that one. And just really get a grasp for for their decisions, at least the ones that they vocalized. But if there was a time that I could go back to and participate in, huh, where would I go? I, I'm a big fan of the present. I love the here and now. I think it's beautiful and amazing. But I think it would be really cool to actually, I guess, kind of around the same time, uh, go to Victorian England and and maybe kind of, I don't know, I think it'd be neat to go to a ball or something for no for no good reason, just because just cause it'd be interesting to just be there with those people and, and see what they think and ask them questions and stuff because it was such a different time. It must have seemed so alien, the, this industrial revolution that came in. Yeah, yeah, it would have been very different. Well, thanks. That's a great answer. I yeah. love it. And then I always ask if you have like a funny story or a funny tidbit that you want to share on the podcast. And you said you could share this on the podcast. So do you remember what you said? Okay. Um, <laughs> funny tidbit. Okay. So funny tidbit about this. I remember what I said. Let me find the picture. Okay. So it's about the picture of the driving of the last spike. So Donald Smith is the guy who drove the last spike. It's a famous photo, at least in Western Canada. And I just want to point out a few funny things because back then, pictures were not, you know, super common, right? That was a, all right, this is a momentous occasion. In this picture, you see Donald Smith driving the last spike. And first of all, first funny tidbit, they, they were so broke, they had no money at all. So they couldn't use a golden spike or anything, right? Like there was this, you know, usually ceremonial excitement around it was just a normal plain iron rail spike um, but he's driving this last spike he actually bent it three times so they had to redo the last spike three times because he kept bending it and then also if you look anybody at home who who looks up the driving of the last spike in Kregeliki, uh British Columbia the gentleman standing right behind Donald Smith he actually wanted to build the railroad further north which is eventually the, the path that the Canadian National Railway took. And then there's also to the right of the photo, if, if you pull it up, there's this kid who just snuck into the photo, the first photo bomb. He just snuck into the, into the photo of this huge event, all these men, all these hardworking guys who worked on the railroad for years. And this kid just weasels his way in there and, 
and <laughs> gets in the photo just in time. And he's kind of got this smug look. And you can kind of look around there of people in the background thinking, what is this kid and why is he standing in my way? Uh, yeah, so it, it's, a, it's a pretty funny picture uh, from an important time in history. Well, that's great. Thank you so much for that. I will definitely try to link it in the show notes. And if not, if it's a free picture that I can repost, then I'll post it on the website blog too. Yeah, that would be awesome. Mm -hmm. I absolutely appreciate the time you took to talk to us about the railway. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Awesome. Well, that was really fun, Alex. I really enjoyed talking to a podcaster and a fellow Canadian. And sadly, I really didn't know enough about this topic. So thanks for sharing. Alex didn't really have a book recommendation today, but he did mention that Heritage Park in Calgary would be somewhere to visit. You can find me on social media, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, at History Day, or find me on my website, historya.com. And of course, you can always rate this podcast. Apparently, it does help people find me. So thanks for helping with that. And as I always do at the end, I want to thank my husband, Jamie, and our brood of kids, our family, our friends. Without them, I wouldn't be adventuring through history right now. Un grand merci. One sec, because my kids are talking. I can hear them. Just one sec. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I only have like two kids at home. They're being louder than when all seven of them are here. <laughs> you have seven kids? <laughs> yeah. I'm the second of seven, so. Really? See, yeah. you're okay, right? You're not and I, I turned you're out fine. fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so cool. I think it's a big party, honestly. Like It is.